It's a real pleasure for me to introduce the audience to Jonathan Tobin. I have been reading Jonathan for probably 30 years. And then I had the great honor of being his guest on his wonderful podcast, Top Story, which I would encourage all of you to add to your download list and, and rate and rank and spread the word about. Jonathan, welcome. It's great to have you on our Home and Away series. Well, thanks so much, you. It was a pleasure having you on, and it's an honor for me to be on your show. Now, Jonathan, your alma mater, King's College, as it was originally known, is now Columbia, <laughs> and it's in meltdown free fall. I would like to begin with an unusual question. How was your experience at Columbia and what years were you there? I was there in the uh, late 1970s. Um, my experience was interesting. Uh, that was uh, during the era of uh, the Soviet Jewry movement. And honestly, it was, as, it was dominated, you know, it was a school that was dominated by leftists and leftist teachers and liberal teachers. Um, but I think there was a real difference. I never felt endangered as a Jew on campus. Um, the left was not obsessed with uh, denying the rights of the Jews. Um, they were much more interested in, you know, sort of trashing the West and the United States in general. Um, but I think it was also an era in which even when you had, as I can recall in, you know, in, at Columbia, Columbia College, um, and that was actually in a time when uh, it wasn't co-ed, um, uh, as Columbia is now, um, that, um, you know, you, you could have in the, in the uh, contemporary civilization course, which is the mandatory liberal great books courses that one had to take there and still has to take uh, when people are showing up for class, I guess. Um, we had plenty of leftist teachers um, who introduced us to... Uh, you know, ideas and that I found quite toxic, like Herbert, I, that's, I can recall reading Herbert Marcuse's uh, Critique of Pure Tolerance, which is, um, which, which I was gobsmacked by it as a, as a very, you know, as a kid reading this great intellectual defense of tyranny, of, of suppressing free speech. And, uh, you know, I, I challenged um, my, my teacher about it, but that was an era in which you can have an argument with, with teachers about things like this, and you can get away with it and uh, be a young conservative, uh, be a Zionist, be a, someone who cared about Soviet Jewry. And, um, you know, you, I, I didn't feel as if I was going to be penalized for it. So that and, was and a big I, difference. And I want to pick up there. I'm a little bit older than you. Harvard in the mid-70s was a very intellectually robust place where you could be a conservative. I arrived out of parochial schools and I had a good education and I knew what I believed and I could argue with people, but there were also faculty members like Harvey Mansfield with whom I could identify politically and intellectually and learn from. But I also took Judith Sklar, who was a woman of the left and it was a robust discussion. Did Columbia still have the common core, the, the hardcore Everybody's got to know where the West came from because the West is a good thing. Did they still have that when you went there? Oh, for sure. In fact, it it, it has it in some form today. <clears throat> I, I think the the core curriculum has been. I, I guess uh, I would be uh, I could be canceled for saying it watered down. There, there, it's much more diverse. Uh, you know, and, you know, sort of put air quotes around diverse. Um, but the, the the great books courses are still there. You still have to take art humanities and music humanities, and um, so so it's 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 still part of the liberal education uh, that one is supposed to get. I had it in its undiluted form as it was originally intended, and quite frankly, I learned a lot. And you know, I was a you know considered. I came from a public school on Long Island, and I considered myself very well read, but I had a lot to learn. Um, so Jonathan, if I we got these students, or the, your contemporary now at Columbia, who are on the quad, if we got them together in a quiet place and we posed these questions to them, number one, what did the Romans do in 70 AD? Number two, what is the pale? Number three, what is the Ottoman Empire? Number four, what is the British mandate? And number five, what is the original anti-colonial experiment in the Middle East? Do you think they could answer any of those? And if so, how many of them do you think they could answer? I would bet, um, based on my encounters with young people, even smart 
educated young people that most of them would get none of those right, um, unless somehow they were history majors of that era, you know, of 20th century um, history majors. Um, in general, um, knowledge of history in this country is abysmal. And that's just as true among the educated elites who are not taught history um, and um, know very little. I mean, it's, it's a cliche that the people chanting from the river to the sea, which is an eliminationist slogan, cannot identify which, you know, those two bodies of water. Um, it's, it's a cliche that, that most of them don't know why they're protesting against Israel, why they're protesting against their school's quote-unquote connections with Israel. But the fact is, the core of all of this has, has really very little, if anything, to do with what Israel is doing um, and nothing to do with history. It has to do with what has happened to the American educational system in the last few decades, and especially in the last couple, in which toxic ideas like critical race theory and intersectionality that had its roots in those uh, neo-Marxist and Marxist ideas that I referenced earlier when I talked about Herbert Marcuse and his critique of pure tolerance, and at, which is um, you know, a screed, a very intellectual screed about why free speech should not be tolerated, that the intellectual should tell everybody what to think and that's it. Um, you know, we talk, you know, as people who discuss American politics, critical race theory and intersectionality, you know, with what happened after the Black Lives Matter riots of 2020, that, you know, for many people, that's just some Republican talking point, uh, you know, conservative cliches, but they explain what is happening at our, our universities today, because as I've been writing about for a few years, and others have as well, these theories, which divide us all in this um, permanent race war between black and white, between quote unquote, Victim, you know, everybody's either a victim or an oppressor, and the world is divided. You are either one or the other, and all victims are alike, all, all oppressors are alike. They're all part of the same struggle. This formulation, which is terrible for America, it's dividing us um, along racial lines when we don't need to be divided, um, grants a permission slip to anti Semitism because it defines Jews and the state of Israel as white, as white oppressors. Um, and that is why all these kids are, are chanting free Palestine and from the river to the sea, because they think this is part of the racial conflict. They, yeah. they think this is part of why um, you know, it, it, it is analogous to the struggle for civil rights in the United States. They don't understand that the Jews are the indigenous people of the land of Israel. They don't know that Jews have rights there. They don't know that the majority of Israeli Jews are themselves people of color by the definitions of the American left. Um, they don't know that the conflict between Jews and Arabs in, this, in, the, in that country, in that small country in the Middle East, is not a racial conflict. Jews and Arabs are more or less the same race. Jews are diverse, they're black, they're, you know, they're white, they're, they're, they're brown. Um, Arabs can be the same too. So this is nothing to do with what they think it has to do with. And that's why they're chanting these. That's why they have in, in you know, what Niall Ferguson called the treason of the intellectuals. This is an, a top driven movement. This is not coming from the working class. This is not coming from supposedly ignorant people. These are supposedly smart people who have been conned by leftist Marxist intellectuals into believing that Israel is a racist state that the Jews are oppressors and that they're committing genocide against the Palestinians, which is not the case. It's a big lie. And that's why these people are, have become functional anti-Semites, whether they understand it or not. I, Jonathan, we have arrived at the same place by very diverse path. I'm the Irish Catholic kid from Ohio, went to parochial school. You're the Jewish kid from Long Island who went to public school. You went to Columbia. I went to Harvard. But we got smart and nobody cared what we thought until we were you know, 30 years old and we actually knew something. But it requires a lot of learning. It requires serious history. They don't even know. These kids don't even know that Israel is the original successful anti-colonial state. So after World War II, many, many former colonies achieved liberation, achieved independence, 
Most of them failed miserably and ended up as either failed states or partially failed states, and they continue to fail. Israel started out as a partition state that the UN set up, and it has succeeded beyond its wildest dreams, but it's the original anti-colonial experiment. They don't know this. And so, Jonathan, I'm going to put you on the spot. How do we fix this problem of America becoming stupid? Well, for me, I mean, there are lots of ways to, to attack this issue and to think about it. For me, it all boils down to this long march of the progressives through our institutions that have made these toxic ideas and myths pervasive and not just, you know, something that to be discussed. They're the new orthodoxy. It's related to the woke catechism of diversity, equity, and inclusion that, you know, to which everybody in academia and then the corporate world and now under Joe Biden, the federal government, all pledge allegiance to. That has to be rolled back. Um, that, that, is, that is the answer for America. That is, for me, the, you know, there are lots of issues that are important. But the most important issue is this battle for Western civilization in which we have to defend our values and that all these things that come together, what was the New York Times 1619 project, uh, critical race theory, they all point us towards this terrible divide. And as always, throughout the history of the West, the Jews are the canaries in the coal mine. Jonathan, Christopher Rufo was on my program before 10-7, and he laid out, and I was gobsmacked is the word you used earlier. I was gobsmacked by his intellectual history of the left, which begins with the man you mentioned, Marcuse, and goes through Angela Davis, and he traces it out in the long march through the institution. I've always kind of laughed at that because it was so stupid. It never, ever worked in history. Wherever it was tried, it ended up in, in tears and blood and slaughter. But it is, it's undeniable. It worked. Herbert Marcuse won. Now the question becomes how to reverse that and I look at every college president who shows up in front of Congress, and the thing is, there isn't one conservative among them, not one even rigorous intellectual, I think. What do you think? Oh, I agree. They're, 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 the, they're all bureaucrats. They're all, uh, you know, basically woke commissars. Um, you know, throughout every, every, certainly, institution of higher learning in this country, you know, the, these woke commissars who enforce the diversity, equity, inclusion catechism control hiring, they control admissions, and they control the administrations now. And um, many, very few of them are actual scholars. But, you know, you ask the key question, how do we roll this back? What do we do? You know, Chris Rufo's book is essential, really essential reading because it traces exactly how it started and where we, where, how we got to this point. You know, I think the answer is, uh, you know, as much as, as you know, we, we conservatives like to be federalists, we need a strong federal government which has a, a Department of Justice that will enforce laws against, you know, racial, against racial discrimination, that will roll back this woke tide, that will enforce the laws against, you know, that ban anti-Semitism. We have to use Title VI um, of the Civil Rights Act to defund all of these institutions, big institutions. Now, what can we do to Harvard? I mean, Harvard's got, you know, this massive endowment. They, they're one of the few... Things, you know, institutions that could exist without federal funding. But this is about more than just Harvard, more than just Columbia or Yale or Princeton. This is about the entire educational system, our entire culture. You know, when you talk about, you know, pop culture, the late night talk shows, it, it, it pervades everything. And, you know, it's, it is only by understanding how this ideology took over our, our culture and took over education, took over corporate and uh, gov you know, the federal government, can you understand how the worst mass slaughter of Jews, the greatest mass slaughter of Jews since the Holocaust, incredible, un unspeakable atrocities that happened on October 7th when Hamas attacked 22 communities and a music festival in southern Israel, that, that instead of that creating uh, support for Israel, that generated a massive surge in anti-Semitism as Israel sought to defend itself against these criminals, against these mass murderers. You can only understand that by looking at the world through the prism of these leftist toxic ideas that have become the new orthodoxy. 
um, that are now mainstreamed in places like the New York Times and the Washington Post and MSNBC. That's where we have to fight this. John, I mentioned earlier, I had come out of the parochial school system, but the parochial school system that was doing penance for Roman Catholic history that had quite a lot of anti-Semitism in it. And so I, I ended up reading books like The Redemption of the Unwanted by Abram Sakar, who was the founding president of Brandeis University, and other books that made me aware of the historical evil of anti-Semitism and how it got into the water. And now I think we really need a second education system in America. And my proposals are very simple. One, no federal funding if you've got an endowment over $10 billion. And two, no federal funding at the uh, at the K through 12 level for any state that does not have school choice as a robust option, because we just have to start over. Edu I don't know that we can rebuild public education. I'm that pessimistic. Are you with me or think I'm over overdoing it there? No, I, you, you, that's music to my ears when you talk about school choice, which, you know, unfortunately, you know, we, we've struggled over the last three decades as much as I think there's Tremendous interest in from parents and um, certainly, especially in in the minority communities who are being victimized by failing public schools. The power of the teachers' unions and now the power of of the you know leftist intellectual ideas that have as we, as we've discussed have taken over education. I, you know it 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 really it it doesn't work. We have to replace it. You know it, it's very hard when you're talking about say elite institutions and. Parents who want to send their kids to, you know, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Columbia, or, or MIT, wherever, you know, they, they think that these are the, you know, the uh, the keys to success in life. But I think the brands have been, you know, degraded by this anti-Semitism and by, you know, the, how the leftists have taken over everything. I think we have to replace it. I think there's some ideas like uh, Barry Weiss and Niall Ferguson's, you know, University of Austin, uh, what the new school. The new new college in Florida that Ron DeSantis and Chris Rufo have uh, of course tried, Hillsdale are trying to establish, and Hillsdale of course, but these are very small. There aren't that many options for sending kids to places where they can learn without this. So, so yes, my last we question, John, this is a big question, so I want to give you three minutes to answer it. Have we lost? I mean, has the West lost? Because. People sometimes, St. Augustine was writing the city of God as the barbarians came over the wall in, in Carthage. And I, I know that you can recover eventually, but do you think we've lost? No, I refuse to believe that. And I refuse to believe that. I'll start with something that was taught to me when I, we, we started our conversation by uh, my experience at Columbia, you know, decades ago during the Ice Age, when we were both young. <laughs> Um, Eugene Rice, who was then the uh, chairman of the history department at Columbia University, said to me, I'll never forget it. He said, everything in history is evitable. Nothing is inevitable. We have not lost. Um, plenty of times in history, things change. Um, Alan Dershowitz, when I had him on my podcast, uh, you know, I asked him, how do we, you know, this is so pervasive. And he said, well, you know, in the 1950s, in order to get a job, you had to sign a McCarthyite pledge about communism. And nobody thought that would change. And within a few years, it was gone. Right now, you have to sign a DEI pledge to get a job in, in higher education. Perhaps if we fight hard enough, if we do not lose hope, if we keep our faith in what we believe in, we have above all, I say this to Jewish audiences, non-Jewish audiences, the thing that we need most is not necessarily even just the facts about the Middle East conflict or about critical race theory. What we need is courage. The courage to stand up for what we believe in, to stand up for Western civilization, to stand up for our faith. And if we do, we can prevail. Without it, we're lost. You know, to, we will give in to the councils of despair, but we cannot despair. The stakes are too high. America is, is too important. It's important to the Jews because without American exceptionalism, the lives of, Jew, of, of the Jewish people in this country will not be worth a damn sooner or later. But also, that's for everybody in this country. We need America to be exceptional. Exceptional. We have to fight for it. It won't be given to us. It's not supposed to be easy to defend what is most important. But we must do it. We must stand up for our values, 
for what's important and against hate and against these toxic ideas that redefine words, redefine what is good and right. We cannot accept it. If you play by their rules, then you're lost. But we can't play by their rules. We have to stand up for what we believe in, the core values of Western civilization. And if we do, we'll defeat the anti-Semites, we'll defeat the people trying to divide America along racial lines. Jonathan Tobin, I cannot improve on that. I'm not going to try to. Courage is the first virtue because it is the virtue on which all other virtues depend. And Jonathan, thank you for a good dollop of your time this morning. I remind everything, everyone, John has a wonderful podcast. Jonathan has a wonderful podcast. It is called Top Story. It is available at iTunes, Spotify, et cetera, et cetera. Download it, rate it, tell people about it, and put JNS.org, the Jewish news service, JNS.org, on your list of favorites. Visit it, get smart every day. I look forward to talking to you again, Jonathan. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Arlie. Thank you, Generalissimo. Thank all of you for listening to today's You Do It Show.